I think um, the the nail industry, it's hard to keep everybody accountable because mm. people don't want to be shunned. People don't want a bad name. Like how, mm. you know, everybody does well when they're people pleasing. It's only when you stop people pleasing that you actually start to like upset people because they can't gain from you anymore. And they're like, damn, I, that, you're not people pleasing me now. I can't gain from you. Mm. So that like right. internal fight that you might have, um, it, it, it's your integrity. That That's what you're fighting with. Polishing my hand, I'm ready to create each nail a masterpiece. I can hardly wait. Soft pastels or vibrant hues, each tells a tale in their artistry of nail. Nothing ever fails. With each swirl and twirl, let the magic begin. In this kingdom of gloss, there's no end to the wind. Gloss on my fingertips, watch them shine bright. Canvas colors taking flight, feeling fierce and fabulous. I'm ready to ignite, slaying the nail game every single night. The nails and beauty talk with Asia the bird. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Nails and Beauty Talk. I am your host, Asia the Bird. Today, we have a very special guest with us today. She is the founder and creator of The Fierce Company. Please welcome Sasha Wilkinson. Hello, Sasha, and welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited for this. I'm so excited for this podcast. Yes, absolutely glad to have you. So I want to go and get started by asking where you're originally from and tell us about your upbringing. So I'm from, obviously, the UK, and I'm from a place which is like north, kind of like northeast it's a little place called Hull. Um, and if you're anything like Timothy Chalamet, he loves the Hull accent. He said that once in an interview, and I was like, that's how I claim to be. <laughs> um, yeah, and we have beaches, and we have countryside, and we have little towns and cities, and it's it's actually a really pretty part of the UK. And I didn't think I used to love it when I was younger, but now I actually love where I'm from. It's a really beautiful part and we don't have to travel far for like different things. And mm. um, yeah. yeah, it's been lovely. Yeah. Yeah, it's really, really cool. So tell us about like your school experience, like primary, secondary school, university and things like that. <clears throat> um, primary was OK. I don't really remember it. And um, high school was awful. I was bullied for the whole five years um yeah and I was a very different person then um I would yeah. never allow that behavior now and I'd like to think it's made me a strong a stronger person um, right. but I would definitely like learn some really toxic traits and I was very like mm -hmm. I feel like I lived in fight or flight for like pretty much my entire teens and that was school mm -hmm. and outside of school, like, issues. Mm -hmm. um, I've been in therapy now for, like, a year, and that's massively helped me, like, unpick behaviours and toxic traits and toxic people. Um, so, yeah, school was not great. But I feel like I lived my best 20s. So early 20s, I went to college and I did photography, which was just a hobby of mine. Mm -hmm. um, and previous to that, I worked in a hair salon. I was a Saturday girl. Do you have Saturday girls in the US? Mm, I don't so think so, no. I just worked there on a Saturday and I would shampoo hair. That was it. I'd sweep the floors. Mm. I would take payments. But I loved the salon vibe, the experience. Mm. Um, I felt really at home there. And I think I've mm. always been quite creative. Um, I've always expressed myself. Um, with like my hair, my clothes, makeup. So I think the mm -hmm. hair salon really gave me like this kind of like safe space to like be myself and to like try new things. Mm -hmm. So I started at the hair salon, went to college, did photography, which I absolutely right. love, but did not want to mm -hmm. do that as a job. I was like, this isn't for me. Um, I like it right. as a hobby, but not for me. And then right. I kind of just worked for a bit. Um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I was very, uh, 
kind of just just plodding along with life really i enjoyed my life i've been with my husband mm -hmm. since i was 17 so i've always wow. had i know i've always had like ni a nice life but career wise yeah. i just was kind of going through the motions um mm -hmm. so yeah it was just th there's not really much to say beyond like pre being a nail tech i just was going through life really mm, yeah absolutely so you're a nail tech and a beauty therapist so what has been your experience and journey having your own nail business so i have absolutely loved every part of the journey the good the bad the ugly however I think the reason people would look at my business and think it's successful is because I've just had to learn quick and I've had to, I don't want to make the same mistake twice. So for me, if something didn't work for me, I'm really quick to learn it. And I've enjoyed being a student in the lessons of life. I like learning. I like yeah. finding things out and researching and just improving my own life and my child right. um so i've really enjoyed the journey of like being day one nail tech to like where mm. i am now it's just pulls apart it's so strange but i've mm. really loved it it's been monumental as well for me as a person i've learned a lot about myself um mm. and what i what i want my future to look like and stuff like that so it's it's been the journey's been wild. I've had so many amazing experiences, like loads of pinch me moments, loads of aha moments, you know, like light bulb moments, um, and mm. just a lot of winging it, um, a lot of winging it through my journey. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> mm, yeah. Right. Absolutely. So I want to also get into the Fierce Company. So you are the founder of the Fierce Company, and you are a beauty business consultant. Tell us about the Fierce Company and the services you offer. So the Fierce Company was was born out of um, a really fluke situation. I was I'm a brand ambassador for Home of Nail Art, Hona. Mm -hmm. yep, we was at their events and one of their community events, which are amazing. And I was mm -hmm. asked to go on stage really last minute by Mike, who was one of the founders, uh, mm -hmm. for a panel, and I was like all right yeah yeah all right like, i don't know what i've got to add but okay and it was just amazing the the community the people that was there the guests are all mm. honer enthusiasts obviously but there was just this massive like need to learn i could sense that in the crowd everybody was there to like learn something new you know really like take the next step in their journey with their career so the questions mm. we were getting asked were really deep and really to the point. And I was getting asked, you know, right. oh, like I don't charge what I should charge. How can I, you know, increase my prices? And I was just talking like girl to girl. This is what I did. This is what you should do. Don't take no shit. Can we swear? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> don't take no shit. <laughs> this is your journey, this is your business, it's yours, like don't let other people um, cloud your judgment, don't let other people interfere with your your journey, this is yours. And I think I was really yeah. passionate about it, I am anyway, but on stage, yeah. I think there was people that could see me in a different light. Um, and there was mm -hmm. like, I kind of got off the stage and everybody was like, you should do this as a business. And I was like, I've always wanted to do that as a business. And so mm. I do it instinctively. If I have a chat with somebody about nails, I, I can't help but like get deep. What's your insecurities? How can we overcome them? Like, how can I yeah. help you? Like, what's similar? Like, I had this and you have this and this is how I dealt with it. I do that instinctively anyway. So I was like, I'd love to mm. do this as a business, but it just, it's not very rare. It's sorry, it's not common in the UK. Right. Like mentorship is quite new, I would say. Um, mm -hmm. But I just massively wanted to be a place and a face that people could ask the really ridiculous questions. You know that you just can't right. find the answers to, and you just need a safe person who won't judge you, who will give you as much information as they physically can, and guide yeah. you as much as they can and be a support and that's 
that's why the Fuse Company was made. And I offer mm. one-to-one personalised mentorship um, in a really safe way. We do it um, over Zoom, so it's it's really accessible. You don't have to be in the right. space. Um, right. And I cover everything from confidence and mindset to how your business looks like on paper, so policies, pricing, location, how to deal with clients, how to deal with bosses, co-workers, right. you know, realistically, any kind of like hard situation that you can't get through, I've either mm-hmm. been through it or researched it and I can advise. Um, and I think it's right. super important for industries to have internal mentors because right. a lawyer mm-hmm. would not accept business advice from a dustbin man and mm-hmm. a chef would not accept advice from um a, a builder because they don't they're mm-hmm. not in your world so we need right. more industry mentors to help people gather information and lead the industry into like a more positive direction otherwise i think yeah. it will continue being this chaotic um environment that is a bit like nobody knows what they're doing and um, well not nobody that's a bit that's a bit broad but there's a lot of people yeah. that like I was in my first like four years winging it I had no idea how to run my business um so that mm-hmm. that's kind of like why it was started and I love it and I have some regular clients and it's lovely and I'm just yeah just out here doing doing the hard work Mm, yeah, absolutely. Most definitely. And the thing is, you know, I like how you're about education in terms of teaching people about the business of the beauty industry, because that's what I've noticed within the industry as well. It's like there's been miseducation, you know, in the nail industry, especially, you know, here in the U.S. And the thing is, I was interviewing people who own their own nail schools and stuff like that. And I like what they're doing as far as properly educating the ones that are up and coming in the nail industry, you know, talking about the ins and outs of the industry as far as business, what to do and what not to do in terms of nail services and things like that. So I like how they're there's education out there where it's like hey like this is the right way to do things yeah we've got there's 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 some people that are understanding that we need Mm -hmm. to set some sort of standard because i don't think it's been set if you look at how nails especially in the uk 20 years ago was a side hustle it wasn't a proper job it was done on right um you know somebody's kitchen table it was just looked at right. as a very much a hobby and yeah, literally yeah. that now yeah, nine to five job. yeah uh, whereas and i think some people have that same mindset yet you mm-hmm. you actually need to make it work because now life is changing and we have a global problem with the financial crippling of people and families. So we have to be the leaders and we have to kind of like say, hang on, this is, if you do it properly, we can sustain this industry. Because if we don't do it properly, there won't be nail techs in 20 years. And that's just, that's just right. a fact because we're not right. doing it properly. We could, we could be contributing to the problems that we see now. And if we carry right. on, those problems are just going to exacerbate. So at some point, we need to just put a bit of a stop in the road and say, hang on, let's try and make this a more positive industry where we can give correct education and we can continually learn from the mistakes or continue learn from things that went wrong um, rather than just keep making those mistakes or just take a different direction, which we don't know where that leads to. You know, I think mm. in, internal right. mentors are powerful people and they're definitely a necessity in service based industries. Absolutely. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Most definitely. So let's talk about the cost of business. So in one of your IG reels, you speak about how beauty professionals wearing a range of hats ranging from bookkeeper, social media expert, content creator, service provider, etc. So what are some of the important things that beauty professionals have to consider to maintain their beauty business as far as costs? I think um, the cost of biz- biz- cost of business looks different for everybody, and that can sound overwhelming. But um, I would love for everybody to just think of it more positively and think of it because it looks different, 
I have this over, overwhelming power to make it mine and to make it represent right. what I vision my business to look like. Um, right. So, you know, it, and again, businesses are completely different from where there was 10 years ago. So we, we need to be moving right. with the times and we also need to be a few years ahead. Like what's the next thing that's coming um, and, and have I got mm-hmm. a grasp of that? Um, we definitely have more hats to wear as business owners now, especially in service based industries, um, because we are learning from the mistakes that the last 20, 30 years has taught us. So we know that we right. have to wear more hats. So you you just have to get over it. Like you just have to wear the hats. But I think it's important that yeah. you give each hat a bit of time and understand when you're wearing one of those hats, am I fully completing the tasks with that hat on? Is this in my capabilities or am I overwhelmed? Because I think it's really important to understand um, if we cannot be successful with one of those hats on, we can get help with that hat. So you're not right. just doing it on your own. You don't have to wing it. You can say, whilst I wear this um, social media hat, I'm really struggling. I'll get some social media help. Or I'm really struggling mm-hmm. with the financial hat. Can you tell me how I can get a grasp of my finances? Ask for the help. It is out there. I know it's vast and I know it's hard to find the right person mm-hmm. for you, but the help is out there. So try and give yourself a break if you can't be perfect with all of the hats on. Um, mm-hmm. But I also think the important things for me are outline. So outline what you want your business to look like. Um, right. How many hours a week, how many days a week and how many weeks a year you would want to work. Outline things like policies, working conditions, locations, the services that you want to provide. Not that you think you have to, but the ones that get you going, the ones that you have passion in. Um, and mm-hmm. try different things. You never know what you might fall in love with. Um, Mm. And I've already I've said it, but always be a student in the lesson of life and business, because if right. you are completely, if you stand still, you're stuck. Business is forever growing. It's not the same as it was yeah. two years ago. Look at where we all are now. Mm-hmm. Two years ago from COVID, right. I run my business right. massively different to then. And that looked different to the year before and two years before. Right. So Mm. always keep going with the times and reflect reflection is a huge tool that's completely free and you can absolutely look at where your business is and where you want it to be and the steps to get there um but Mm. i also think plan plan for the uncertainty like plan for if you're if you ever get sick plan if you have a baby plan if you're going to move location plan if you're going to move house Plan if you're going to have a big life altering situation, have plans there so that when those things either do happen or may happen, that you have control Mm. over it. Um, And you've not lost that control. It's still your business, but I've I've got a plan. I'm I'm, I'm one step ahead. I think that's crucial um, with mental health, especially for people who struggle with their mental health. Planning is... I know it's hard, it's not always easy, but it's important. And it is a tool that later on you'd reflect and think, oh, actually, yeah, that did Mm -hmm. help me out. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to get into um, prices and clientele. So when is it okay for a nail artist and nail tech to raise their prices? Also, how does a nail tech and nail artist gain like Ferrari clients? I love this question. Ferrari clients, yes, they are our people. Ferrari clients are the je ne sais quoi of the services it's the why we do it like yes everybody wants to get paid and yes people want to do the job that they love but it sucks if the person in the chair isn't some that you vibe with it sucks so finding those people that i offer our clients for me is a goal that should be on everybody's journey like journey list it's got to be there because once you find them it makes your job not a job and it makes your job your life and you you know there's a there's a quote that's out there and it's like if you find a job you love you never work a day in your life and right i think those ferrari clients are the last piece of that puzzle because they're Mm -hmm. the ones that make it that way so Mm -hmm. i think it's super important that um you you 
project everything that you want to receive. So when, when you project a cheap business and an unorganized business, scatty, um, you're, you're unreliable or anything like that, that's exactly how it looks and will feel to the client. So if you don't want those as clients, we mirror what we want. So um, right. if you want cheap clients that are scatty and won't pay prices and, and they they bail on you and they cancel last minute or they don't turn up, then you have to show that that's not the type of client that you want. So you have to, right. with your business, start representing what you want and give them a sort of visual and let them know how it feels being in your space and how it feels to be a client of yours and and what it takes right. to be a client of yours because you might that you might not be their person and that's okay but you've given mm, them a really good right. representation so they mm. might come in a little bit more um knowledgeable and a little bit more at ease because they know who you are and they know what your business is about right. and they know what's important to you so i think <clears throat> getting your Ferrari clients is definitely showing who you are as a Ferrari tech. So I'm the best because I do blah, 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 blah. And, right. you know, show that use social media is free. What, like how incredible of a tool is that? It's free. Right. So show people your personality, show people how fucking good you are at your job. Show people Absolutely. why you're amazing why they should be sat in your right. chair and and I think once you've done that and you you do it consistently you're going to get people that will just be attracted by that energy um and people will want to be in your space people will want you to do the nails because they're the best in your local town or you just do right. it the way that they like so I think to mm. get the clients you have to be the tech you know like that you want mm. to receive right um and also like when you came when you spoke about raising prices i think obviously this is just such a hot topic i think it always will yeah. be i think this is the yeah. biggest insecurity for service providers full stop mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the reason it that is is because it's still a taboo to talk about it so i just want to say thank you for including this in the questions because i think it's so important to talk about it and reduce the taboo um, but mm. I, you asked, you know, when should a nail tech raise their prices? Whenever they are needed to be raised. So mm. if you do further training, raise your prices. Mm. If that impacts that mm. client significantly, like if I did an accountancy course, it wouldn't impact my client. So maybe I wouldn't need to raise the prices for that. But if I did right. an eFAL course, or if I did, um, uh, I learned another skill, or if I developed something, then you, your clients are going to be the first people that benefit from that education. So because they're right. going to benefit, the price needs to be increased. And this is mm -hmm. something that is so normal in the hair world, so normal in the lash world, so normal mm. in aesthetics, yet in the mm, nail makeup. world... It's like I could spend years learning more things and my prices don't mm. go up. People question it. Right. But if a hairdresser comes from being basic to um, intermediate, their price is different. Right. And then they go from intermediate to really, really good, their price is different. And I'm like, it's so yeah. accepted in the hair, hair world, but in the nail world, it's kind of questioned. And I, I don't know why yeah. that is. I haven't got an answer as to why that is. But it's weird and it needs to stop. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you want mm. the best nail tech, then she has to feel safe in learning more and spending that time and that money because learning good stuff ain't free. She has to right. feel safe to pay that money to know that she's going to get it back and that her clients are going to support her in it. If you just want crap nail techs, then carry on talking about pricing carry on complaining that prices mm. are too high or how dare you charge such and such carry on because in 20 years mm. time you will not have excellent nail techs you will have people that will put basic gel gel polish on and they won't do any more because what's the point it's not financially viable 
So raise your prices when your minimum wage increases, raise your prices mm -hmm. when you have further education and raise your prices when overheads increase. They are the three mm -hmm. areas that prices should be raised. Mm, absolutely. You talked about reasons why clients leave their nail tech after raising prices. Could you expand more about those reasons as to why clients leave due to increasing prices? I think clients leave for a reason that's bigger than the reasons to stay. And that's completely mm -hmm. personal to the client. It's not personal or deep for the tech. Don't forget, I know we're people, but we are offering a service. And you right. only get a service when you need it or want it. And then mm -hmm. it, you might want it. I want a facial every week. Can I afford a facial every week? No. So I don't get one. And it's like, that's it. It's not within my budget. And my budget's dependent on my family, what I, what I class as a priority. I want to go on two holidays a year. So I have right. to financially support that goal of mine. If I have facials every week, I can't go on my holidays. So everyone's forever juggling this financial balance. And it's unfair of us just because we offer a service-based industry to expect everybody to always facilitate these luxury services in their weekly or monthly budget. It's unrealistic. Right. And the problem is, if you continually rely on that unrealistic expectation, you're only going to be met mm -hmm. with disappointment. So I think it's really crucial mm -hmm. to understand your business as a service provider will always ebb and flow. It will always go up mm -hmm. and down. There will always be your ride or dies, the girls that have been with you from day one, and there'll mm -hmm. also be new, fresh, amazing friends that will come through the door and They'll mm. just be like, I fit here. This is where I sit. Mm. This is where I'm comfortable. I'm part of your tribe now. And they will stay right. there for as long as they can financially stay there. It's not our job mm. to um, to put our prices to our client's budget because no other industry mm. does this. It's a ridiculous requirement. If that was the case, you would Ferrari wouldn't be made. Because Ferrari is a luxury car for a reason. They right. are offering something to people that have a bigger budget than those that have a Ford car mm. or a Mini. They, yeah, yeah. It's, they, there's a whole reason for it. And every industry has yeah. cheap and basic and luxury and expensive. Every industry. Food, right. alcohol, um, restaurants singers like Beyonce Cars. doesn't charge what your local pub singer would charge like there's a reason for that because she's Beyonce right. like she's amazing so we have to mm. kind of like sit in this little place of uncomfortableness for just a hot minute and understand that if your client leaves it's because of their finances it's not a representation of your work and also mm. If we're going to um, allow our work to be judged by the client's budget, we would get nowhere. You know, like mm -hmm. nothing would grow because nobody wants to right. pay. Could you imagine 10 years ago paying for like a Netflix thing? Could you imagine that? We had DVDs and we you'd go to the cinema and that was it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you think, yeah, blockbuster. like, I'm not paying to just have them on tap. I don't need them on tap. And now everyone has Netflix. It's wild. Yeah. And that's because the industry moved. And that's okay. Like, if you can't right. afford Netflix, you don't have Netflix. It's just as simple as that. If you can't afford these right. luxury treatments, that's okay. It's not, it's mm -hmm. not your client's job to reassure you that you're good at your job. You know you're good at your job because you've got, mm -hmm. you know, a wealth of clients. So if a client leaves, I'd love people to just not take it personally and understand that it's, mm -hmm. it's their finances. It's not, it's not you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Let's talk about the concept of imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. So what is imposter syndrome and how does it affect the nail and how does it affect nail and beauty professionals and how does one overcome or manage imposter syndrome? 
So imposter syndrome, in like a nutshell, is people who doubt their accomplishments and they have fear of being exposed as a fraud. Because despite evident success and validation externally, they don't associate their accomplishments with hard work. They're associating it mm. with like luck. So if I'm just lucky and I get this big, this big deal, I've only got that because I was looking. It's not because I worked really hard or because I know my shit. Oh, and that's that's where that's basically what it is. It's this self doubt. Um, and it and it's an insecurity within yourself. Everybody has it. Right. I haven't had a conversation with anybody in this industry that does not reflect or understand or resonate with imposter syndrome. It's unfortunately a symptom of the industry because when you offer a service, it's up for judgment. Mm. And we're never going to get out of that. Everybody compares... You know, if, if if you was a client and you had a budget and two people with two techs was in that budget, the next thing you would do would judge their work. Like, and it's just the way it is. You want the best thing. Right. When you're buying a car, you look at the spec of the car and then you might look at the look of the car or you'll, you might feel, see how the seats feel or how much space is in the boot. But realistically, we're looking at the price of the car and the spec of the car first. So it's unfortunate right. that we're judged on um, the end result, but we are. And if you don't like it, right. this industry isn't for you because that's how people pick things. It's how they choose their text. Right. So mm -hmm. um, to get over your imposter syndrome, I would say it's more of like acknowledging your feelings when you're in it. So if you can, when you're overwhelmed, that's a good place to start. If you're thinking, oh, God, I feel like I shouldn't belong, that's imposter syndrome. So in that moment, try and just acknowledge I'm feeling imposter syndrome and that's okay. It's a feeling that's okay to be here. I'm going to move past it. Like any feeling. Mm -hmm. um, right. Talk about it with somebody who is a trusted and safe person. Don't talk about mm -hmm. imposter syndrome with somebody who isn't going to be gentle with your feelings. It's only ever mm -hmm. going to exacerbate the imposter syndrome. You need to talk about it with somebody that's safe, that understands the feeling. Right. Maybe they felt it themselves. Somebody that can have a right. holding hand. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And then reframe your thoughts from negative self-talk to positive self-talk. So I'm only here because I was lucky. I'm here because I worked hard and I'm fucking good at what I do. Oh, God, everybody's going to judge me. Everybody's going to listen to what I've got to say, and some people might take something away from it. Do you see? It's it's a it's mm -hmm. um it's a learning tool, but it is important to try and get yourself out of the negative talk. <clears throat> right. And then embrace the failure. This is hard. Um. <clears throat> sorry, let me just grab. Go ahead. Um, embracing failure is such an adult thing, and I. It's annoying, but it it will just help you learn because the universe mm. will put you in the same scenario over and over and over again until you learn the mm. lesson to get out of it. And I wholeheartedly believe that. When people say, I keep making this mistake, my immediate answer is, the universe is telling you you've not learned the lesson yet. You've got to do something different. Like, you've not learned the lesson to get out of this mistake yet. <laughs> So right. imposter syndrome can sometimes come from like, I made a mistake before, oh no, um, oh, I don't want to do that again. It's okay, you've made the mistake. Let's just try and learn from it. Let's try not do that one again. And then also right. celebrate your successes. The celebration of your success releases endorphins in your body. It makes you feel good. And it creates these neural pathways from the hard work to the success. So when you celebrate mm. that, your brain makes that neuro pathway and it allows you to understand the hard work paid off and that's why I went through that mm. and this was worth it. And these are all like positive feeding feelings and internal monologue. If you're not feeding mm. that internal monologue of that, then you're never going to have it. So you've got to celebrate the little wins 
And that'll sometimes let you understand that you're maybe not an imposter because, I, you know, I'm kind of winning here. I'm, I'm winning the little wins. Um, yeah. Also, understand that hard work isn't luck. Like, the amount of people that say you're lucky or, well, it must have just been lucky. And I'm like, I fucking work hard. Like, mm -hmm. you're not here when I'm here at midnight researching or I'm here crying because I made a mistake or I've spent hundreds of thousands of pounds on my education. Not hundreds of thousands, I haven't, that's a lie. I've spent thousands of pounds on my education to... Right to do better and to not make this mistake again because I don't like this feeling of like I've made a mistake right. it's not lucky right. it's hard work and you shouldn't be ashamed to say that um and then this is a very hard one but avoid comparison it's so hard but try and avoid yeah. comparison because it will steal your joy and it'll stop you from being able to celebrate the little wins it's so hard and I and this resonates with so many of my clients but you have to celebrate your little wins because all the people that you look up to they have the same little wins you know and mm -hmm. and they just did it and they didn't they maybe didn't compare they just they just went with it so I think there's yeah. some tools to really establish how you can get over imposter syndrome and how you can work through the feelings hopefully mm -hmm. that's that's helpful right. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, that's definitely helpful. So I want to get into as far as policies. So what would be some of your tips as far as establishing policies with clients? So I would say it's the three C's. This is what I say to all of my clients. So it's clear, consistent and connect with your business. So from the minute you decide this is my business and it's not a side hustle, that day, that's the day. So from this day, we're going to have a clear policy. I'm going to be clear about how I run my business. I'm going to be clear mm -hmm. about what the clients need to do when they're here or how they need to be as a client. So in your policies, you might say things like, I mean, again, it's it's different for every business, but you might say things like, I don't have children at my appointments because X, Y, and Z. Other people mm -hmm. might allow children and that's great for them, but you might not want children in your appointment for whatever reason. So. Mm -hmm. You're allowing the client to understand what type of client you want because you're outlining mm -hmm. these little areas that are sometimes up for discussion or sometimes up for mm -hmm. question or maybe just not clear because, again, everybody's business is different. I right. I allow car payments. Some people only accept cash. I allow you to bring your slippers if you want. Some people will allow that. Like every business is different. Your, right. your policy is like, I call it your big sister. It's the thing that has your back when you don't want to be up front. So how do you get all this information across to your client without being like, and this and that and this and that and that? Like they need yeah. it just just post it, put it in a little, put it in a little message, make it really clear and then mm. be consistent so hold people accountable hold yourself accountable and um, if you run over time or if you make a client late um make sure that you're always apologetic try and not do that again because you don't want your clients to be late that's my biggest pet peeve um i can't stand it when clients are late does my head in um but life happens and i'm quite understanding and everybody has a little grace 10 minutes that's fine mm. but don't take the mick otherwise i'm going to hold my policy accountable because it I, it was made clear i'm going to be consistent with it and it connects with mm. my business that's it that's your policy mm. and whatever you put in there is personal to you and your business and it's not up for mm. discussion it's not up for question that's not what a policy is. We don't ring our phone companies and say, hang on, in this policy, it says if I don't pay my bill, you can take my phone. Well, I don't agree to that. And they go, oh, right, okay. That that doesn't happen. That's not what a policy is. So it's, it's, mm. it's outlining your business on paper and then delivering it to your clients in a really readable, nice, polite way. 
basically. Mm. Do you have policies and stuff in the US? Do you is, do nail techs do that type of stuff? Mm, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, nail techs and nail artists, they do have like policies, you know, for their salons and nail studios as far as like late fees in terms of clients, you know, what they should be doing and, you know, uh, whether their nails had to be bare or, you know, people, some people will say, or a lot of nail artists and nail techs will say like, we, we don't, I don't do like, you know, work over other artists work and yeah. things like that. So yeah, there's definitely policies here in the US as well. Yeah. And then how do you work that with like, do you have a lot of walk-ins in the US? Do, yeah. You have salons that have walk-ins. So mm -hmm. how, do yeah, you, yeah. how do you cope with that if they don't, if they're not aware of the policy? Um, I would say like, you know, I, I don't have my own salon personally, but I've worked in salons where they, you know, included walk-ins and stuff like that. So if it's a walk-in, it could be like, maybe like a Friday or Saturday or something like that. Um, you know, um, I'm sure like with the owners, they, they let the clients know, like, these are our policies and mm -hmm. things like that in terms of walk-ins and things like that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so there, so there are businesses such as like salons or nail salons or nail studios that say, Hey, you know, this, you know, we can allow walk-ins or don't allow walk-ins and you know, a lot of a lot of those other things. Yeah. So in that scenario, that person who's walking into that salon either has a choice to stay or leave when you give them the policy, right? And that's the exact same in in any other way that we connect to our clients. That's why I'm saying it's not up for question because they have a choice. It, a lot mm. of the time here in the UK, people have a policy, but they don't stick to it. The text don't stick to it. And they're leaning in mm. and they they let people off and, and all of that. And then they wonder why people don't respect it or they don't um, stick to it. And I'm like, because they had a choice when they booked in with you. These are the policies, agree or disagree, come or go. Like, it's not my job to, like, make you stay. I'm not going to alter mm. my policies for you. They're for me and my business. So. It's interesting because there's not a huge amount of walk-ins in like UK um, salons because obviously the techs need to like try and get as much regular work as possible. But also there's mm -hmm. a lot of at-home techs now, lots and lots. Since COVID, I'd say it's more like 60, 40 now of at-home salons to working in a salon. Um, mm -hmm. And because of that, um, you, you kind of like, the salon you know in in your home so you, you you do have to be a bit more like the boss and it, I think that can be a little bit overwhelming for people to stick to their policies but yeah I think it's mm -hmm. it, it's difficult because this um industry has always questioned policies so it's hard for us to take this leap of no nope, I'm mm -hmm. not going to let you question mine and and then just stay there with it you know it, it's it's a learning mm -hmm. it's a learning curve absolutely yeah mm, yeah absolutely yeah i don't know too much about like walk-ins you know into it into a full depth yeah so uh you know i i answered the best of my ability yeah but, you know i i know there's, there's nail professionals in here in the u.s that do offer walk-ins at certain days and things like that yeah you know and they also have you know their own policies and things so you know i'm just going based off of like you know like the salons i've worked in yeah you know what i mean because yeah. i worked in a spa because there's like certain days like during the weekend like whereas like walk-ins like hey you can walk in you know um have a service and things like that or you know book an appointment of, of what time we're available and stuff like that so um yeah so i'm just coming from from that type yeah. of perspective yeah, no, that it's good. Mm. It's it's nice to learn how the US work because we do we do the same job, but we obviously the countries let us run it completely differently. Your levels of of mm -hmm. education are way higher than ours, um, as in terms of becoming an nail tech. So yeah, it's just it's just interesting to to learn. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to get into as far as the nail industry in the UK. So what is your perspective of the nail industry in the UK, especially from a business and educator point of view? Um, for me, I would say the nail industry is an ocean and it's an ocean of creativity and community and friendship. Mm -hmm. Some of my best friends are nail techs. I wouldn't meet them if I wasn't a nail tech. Um, I was away in Dublin this weekend for my friend's 30th birthday, who I met through being a nail tech through COVID. That's it. Like, mm -hmm. we just clicked, and now we're going to Dublin. Mm -hmm. Like, we celebrated Dublin. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. um, 
So it's it's an ocean full of all of those lovely positive aspects. But obviously, like in any ocean, there are sharks and there are things that will bite you. So I think it's right. super important to try and learn how to build the boat to stop you from getting bitten by the sharks, but enjoy the ocean. You know what I mean? Like you can right. build yourself a bit of a resilience um, yeah. to a lot of things that are in the industry. Like I've just said, you know, we're not as regulated in the UK. Um, like clients aren't massively bothered if you're even qualified. Like I know people who do this who are not qualified. They buy a lamp off Amazon, they get their gel polishes off Amazon, and then they mm-hmm. they do clients. That's it. And there's no one arresting them. There's nobody checking in on them. It's 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 like the wild, wild west. It's like, how is this physically possible? But it just is because it's not regulated. So because of that, there's not really a standard that's ever been made. And there's always this comparison mm-hmm. When, especially when it comes to pricing, of like, how do you explain to somebody, but I charge what I charge because I've spent seven years educating myself. I trained with this person. I'm qualified in this. Here, I'm qualified in this. I've learned this. Blah, blah, blah. To somebody who else who just got some stuff off Amazon. And it's like, they're poles apart. They're absolutely poles apart, but people can't see that. People can't see the same as they could, like, two cars next to each other. Well, the spec on that car is not as good, but the spec on this car is great. I'll go for that car. We don't have the same because the outcome sometimes looks the same. Whereas what what we plow into getting the outcome, that journey will have been different. So because we're not regulated, no one holds us accountable like I say, there is an minimum standard, which makes it hard for us who do work really hard on creating a luxury appointment and a luxury service. Um, mm-hmm. And it's hard for us to try and push the barriers of standard because of that. But I don't mm. think that's ever going to change in the UK. It would be really expensive to regulate it. And I don't think the government mm. find it important. So for, for the next five years, at least, I just don't think it's getting regulated So we have an internal work to do. We have an individuality that goes, which type of tech do I want to be? Do I want to be known for having a high standard, for being really hygienic, for using the best brands, for updating my knowledge? Or do I want to be associated with those that would appear like the Backstreet Salon-esque And I think that's just the choice you have to make. And once you've made Mm -hmm. that choice, you go down that journey to prove um, and explain how you're going through that journey and the education that you're taking and whatnot. And at the end of that, I think that's what else will help lead people to increase their pricing because they can start explaining, well, I don't buy polishes off Amazon. Like I'm buying £17 bottles and I'm, my e-files regulated and it's legal it's not off amazon like do you know what i mean so right. we have an internal standard that we as techs need to add we just need to decide what's acceptable and what's not um and educate ourselves with the knowledge that is out there there is enough knowledge out there for people to get a good understanding of what's kind of acceptable and what isn't and even mm. though the not really accepted stuff is still allowed doesn't mean that we have to represent that side of it we can do better in my opinion Mm, yeah absolutely so i want to get into and push forward and talk about what happened back in april so back in april um the nail tech org established a day called national nail tech increase price day and so this is a day for nail artists and nail techs to increase their prices in terms of their nail services and things of that nature um during that same time they made a statement um, the gel bottle made a statement during that same time, that same day, that they were going to increase their prices on their products. And so, you know, as a result of them doing this, 
this thing that they pulled in terms of putting out that statement, there was, you know, nail brands that came out and said, we're not going to increase our prices. Um, also, too, there were beauty professionals, nail professionals that were criticizing heavily on the gel bar of what they did. Um, so you're one of the individuals that spoke out and made a post on social media surrounding the issue, you know, concerning the gel bottle. So when you first witnessed the controversy surrounding the brand, what was your response and reaction? And um, reaction? Sheer panic because I was inundated. I was like, what is going on? What, what's happened? <laughs> there was just messages coming left, right and centre um, of sheer panic of people that use the gel bottle who had just spent so much time and energy and self-reflection trying to re reorganize their pricing with the services that they provide and then this was like it felt like a blur to the industry and it, i felt mm -hmm. like it was a blur to what amy and the nail tech org girls were trying to do which was just lift the industry like a big hand, a big hug, let's just all come together, let's right. lift the industry and let's try and keep up with the other aspects of beauty. Aesthetics, right. lashes, brows, everything else, hair, they do not charge what we charge per hour. They charge way more as they should. They're luxury treatments, they're highly skilled, they're highly developed, they are years of training and perfecting and it's a skill. As nail techs, you know being a nail tech is all of those things yet we just don't right. charge as much because again for some reason it's always been up for question um mm -hmm. and i really supported the nail tech org and what they were standing for and i had i was helping people and um, some of my clients through this transition mm -hmm. um anyway and you know letting people just understand what they could do little quick tips um Right. Obviously, it wasn't my thing, so I didn't. I'm not. I didn't want to overtake it. And um, this was Amy and the Nail Tech Org, and absolutely, they needed that time to shine. And it was an incredible attempt at lifting the the industry. And mm -hmm. I was just so disappointed with the gel bottle and their choice of day and their wording and the just the lack of in the just a lack of sensitivity of mm -hmm. they're obviously out of touch in my opinion of how nail techs are really feeling at the moment right because if mm -hmm. you was in touch you would never have posted that you would never in a right. million years have thought this is a good day so because it was already out of touch and I feel I felt this anyway. I wasn't disappointed that it was the gel bottle that came out and said, we're going to raise our prices by two pound per bottle on the same day that you've all trying to, you know, up your prices by about a pound. It didn't surprise me. I wasn't shocked. I was really disappointed and I was really heartbroken for the girls that would be affected. Um the people that would be affected, sorry. So for me it represented that they look at us as nail techs as cash cows in my opinion that's it mm -hmm. we're not massively going to stand by you we're not that asked about the community we just want to get money from you left right and center mm -hmm. and i know there are excuses mm -hmm. where we haven't raised our prices in such a long time and all of that all of those excuses it doesn't undo mm -hmm the huge panic and uncertainty and upset that they caused. Um, these girls, so a lot of these people that was increasing their prices on that day did it through sheer upset and through sheer like um, necessity of like, I can't pay my bills. Like I have no luxuries in my life because I'm not charging enough. It wasn't through oh yeah i'll just i'll just put my prices up like i'm doing fine but i'll put my prices up it wasn't like that it was a necessity so for me right. i was really disappointed and i just felt like the business looked at nail techs as cash cows and for me m the reason why i um made my statement was because as a nail tech um I, I'm not I'm not connected to the gel bottle in any way and I wouldn't ever use a product. So as a nail tech, it didn't bother me because I wasn't affected. I would never use them. But as a mentor mm. for this industry, 
it affected me hugely because I'm trying my hardest to make it as positive and as inclusive and as, you know, as, as forward focused as we possibly can. And I just thought mm. this company is taking us two steps back on the same mm -hmm. day that they should have shut their trap and gone, well done, girl, well done, people, well done, nail techs. Yeah, mm -hmm. we'll stand back, let you have this day, well done. Upgrade, you know, up, up, um, increase your prices, and we will just support you quietly from the back, like every other business did. Every other nail mm -hmm. brand in the world, in the world, did not raise their prices on that day. Every single mm -hmm. nail business did not increase their prices right. on that day because they're smart enough and they're involved enough with their community to know this is not the time, this is not the place. Right. My problem mm -hmm. was that obviously this company just looks at their clients as their customers as cash cows because you you didn't need a lot of brain cells to put those two together, in my opinion. It wouldn't have taken you long. Like you could have had a few conversations maybe with like a handful of nail techs and said, we need to increase our prices. We're thinking about doing it on this day. How does that resonate with you? And every single one of them would have said, absolutely not. Don't do it. So they, they've obviously not done any research on it. And to me, it's just the lack of accountability and it was the lack right. of sensitivity for me. That's why I was mm. disappointed. But I wasn't shocked. I was not shocked. And I think there's loads of amazing brands that value their customers enough to do the research. Um, and whether they silently supported or whether they outwardly supported, put your money with them. That's where you should put your mm. money with the brands that see you as a like a community. Yes, the brands gain from us, but if they didn't, if they was never around, we would never have what we have. So it's a mutual respect. And I think, mm -hmm. I think this has just massively opened people's eyes to the possibility of how other brands do business. And actually I could, I'd rather right. resonate with them and I'd rather work with them. Um, we, we don't just have one one gel polish brand anymore, which is a lovely thing. And I and I love mm. it because now mm. we have choice and we don't just have to take the shit from these brands that want to continuously shit on the nail techs that are trying to just right. earn a living for their families, do what they love, right. do what their passion is. If it wasn't for us, you wouldn't mm. have a business. So at some point... Absolutely. Businesses are going to have to get on top of this community and get on top mm -hmm. of treating us as mutual beneficiaries as opposed to just clients, as opposed to just customers who come in and we just take their money. Because if mm -hmm. if I had my way, that stuff would be, would be regulated. If the government cared mm -hmm. enough, which they don't, but if they did, that shit should be regulated and those companies should have been mm -hmm. held accountable for their pricing. Mm -hmm. And also, like without getting into it, their gel their gel bottles are already a high price point. In fact, they're one of the highest price point gel polishes on the market currently. Mm. And I work closely with brands. I have an insane amount of knowledge about how the brands work, how they come up with their prices, the the shipping, the costing, the research, the um, the factories, the the every, everything that goes into it. I'm massively aware of, right. and I know for a fact they don't need to be charging you nineteen pound or whatever it is now. I think it's nineteen pound. They don't need to be charging you nineteen pound. She also. Um, the, the business was something like £4.8 million pound in profit in 2023. I think so. That, to me, is not... Uh, just wrong place, wrong time, hon, in my opinion. Mm. And, it, like I say, it didn't disappoint me. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think somebody, I think somebody mentioned that on TikTok that you know of how they was making millions of dollars off of, off of the um, in terms of them selling their products and stuff like that. And I think to me, you know, I think you had every right to really you know issue your point of view because you're saying like, yo, my position in the industry is to really be like, yo, like let's hold these brands accountable. You know, the gel bottle, what they did wasn't right. And and I can even agree that wasn't right of the gel bottle to do that, you know, to pull the stunt of mm-hmm. we gonna um, increase our prices and things like that. And then they said, I think they put another statement or something like that, talking about they're gonna increase their prices in October yeah. or something like that. Yeah, You know what I mean? And so like, you know, I'm like, the national nail tech increased prices. That's for nail techs and nail artists to increase their prices. That's not for y'all to be like, um, we're gonna go ahead and increase our product prices. Yeah, that's not fair. Because then the nail techs don't benefit. It goes, it goes from the client back to the gel bottle. So mm, you're not yeah. supporting the middle person who apparently you know you really value. You're not supporting us. You're taking from us. And it's not right. like n- n- there's no nail tech that is declaring four point eight million pound in profit. The the audacity, the audacity of this company to earn. As much as they earn with the amount of customers that they have and to be so spiteful and use that day was monumental in how people view them now and Mm -hmm. also how people are viewed when they use them as a brand. So now you've got clients who are going, who do you use? And I'm like, I Mm -hmm. use Herna. Great. Can I book in with you, please? And I'm like, whoa. I've not been asked that ever. Like, like I think wow. the first times I got asked what brand I used was after the gel bottle. I don't think I was ever asked mm. before that, unless there was people who are allergic, because Hona is hypoallergenic, so they don't have any of the um, top 10 or top 11, I think, um, known mm. allergens in nail products, they don't include them. So if somebody knows they've got an allergy to nail products, then they would go around and ask because they'd have to have done their own research. But for people mm. who who just like everyday people who don't have an allergy, I have never been asked what brand I use. And I, and I said mm. to these clients when they came, why did you ask me what brand I use? And I was like, well, I don't want the gel bottle. And I was like, whoa. This is because you're not even in the you're on the outskirts, you're a customer. Like how right. but but now you're involved because now you're hearing how it's affecting people and the nail tech and businesses and also the clientele. Now you're researching right. it and it's getting out. And I'm like, I like where this is going because this is like the public court, and that's what might change how businesses go the little lies and the misinformation and the little oh we didn't mean it those won't wash with people in the public car so if these businesses keep making these mistakes i hope and pray that people will still hold them accountable and it's Mm. just it's difficult for people to do that because it's not a very comfortable place to be Now, do you think that nail brands in the nail industry practice enough brand integrity and accountability? Why or why not? I think um, the the nail industry, it's hard to keep everybody accountable because mm-hmm. people don't want to be shunned. People don't want a bad name. Like how, mm-hmm. you know, everybody does well when they're people pleasing. It's only when you stop people pleasing that you actually start to like upset people because they can't gain from you anymore. And they're like, damn, I, that, you're not people pleasing me now. I can't gain from you. Mm. So that like right. internal fight that you might have, um, it, it, it's your integrity. That That's what you're fighting with. So I think right. as an industry, I feel like we're probably on a on the slow journey to allowing that internal integrity come out of it so people can have their opinions about industries and businesses and services and and all of that the whole shebang Um, and i hope that that would just snowball and become way more regulated and way more way more proper education and less miseducation because that's just the whole that's just the whole conversation right there Um, but mm-hmm. yeah, I think it's just I think it's just important to just understand that it's time for people to see the red flags in businesses 
and things that we do in the industry and go, that's not for me. And if it's not for mm. me and everybody starts saying that, then that will in turn start some sort of snowball effect. Because if it's not for you, it probably won't be for another thousand people, you know, or 10,000 mm. people or 100,000 people. Right. So it just takes some some strong willed person, I think, to try and get the industry going. Um, and I, I, I'd like to think that it's going to turn into the most beautiful place and it's going to be so safe and inviting and and yeah. just amazing. But I think we have a long journey to get there. Yeah. Mm. But I have to. Yeah, I can agree with that. Yeah, I can totally agree <laughs> with that. Now, what are some things you found the most rewarding in regards to your job? I think for me, it was just being allowed to be myself. I, because in my other job, like before I was an nail tech, I spent 10 years in retail. And mm -hmm. even though it's like a face to face job, you have to wear somebody else's hat. And I didn't like that. I don't like that I have to take somebody's attitude or somebody speaking to me like I'm something off the bottom of their shoe or having to put up with toxic environments or toxic people or just people that I just don't want to be around. When you're in retail, right. you ain't got a choice. So for me, what I love is that, and what I found rewarding is that I could just be myself. And like, what a beautiful right. thing. Like, this is my job and I just get to be myself. Mm -hmm. like, that's pretty cool, right? right? Not everybody can say that. <clears throat> yeah. But I find it really rewarding with the Fears Company to just help my clients reach places that they didn't think they could. So they'll always come in with some sort of insecurity or things that they just think is completely unreachable. And I'm like, mate, mm -hmm. do you remember when, we, when you thought this was unreachable? And look where you are now. Mm -hmm. I, I love that. This just like feeds my soul. It just, I love it because I want people to just think I'm getting up, I'm doing my job. I love it. It's not a chore because that's not what it's supposed to be. Yeah. If you're in a service or creative environment, the last thing you need is to think it's a chore. It will not right. serve you. So I find it really rewarding when I see people coming out of their shells and just really trying to focus on what their journey looks like and almost putting mm -hmm. like, you know, like the blinkers on of like, I'm just focused on me. I'm not looking at what they're doing or they're doing. I'm just focused on me. Mm -hmm. And this is my reality. This is my journey. And that I found right. so empowering and so necessary because we're teaching the next generation about how mm -hmm. to be and what's acceptable. And, and and we all have a job for the next generation. So I like mm -hmm. to see this, this where nail techs are now, trying to just be a bit better than the generation before and just trying to learn a bit quicker and just do things a bit differently. Um, I find that super rewarding and just people trusting me with their life and with their business like mm -hmm. you know they 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 dive really deep and I'm so fortunate mm -hmm. that people feel safe with me to do that because the deeper we get mm -hmm. the quicker we get there in my opinion so I that's that's a huge part for me and it's something I will always value I just love it when people feel safe in like my company and just think I could just tell you everything and I can cry <laughs> and I can tell you all of my problems and I know that it's safe here and I know that you're going to help me that is just mm. if that just feeds my soul completely I love that mm. yeah absolutely now how do you balance being a parent wife businesswoman with life and mental health oh. not very well <laughs> 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 I try really hard. Okay. I try really hard. Um, <laughs> I don't always get it right. I mm. sometimes fuck up. But my absolute favorite thing about me is, is that I self-reflect. I am not afraid mm. to be like, oh, I fucked up. I did something wrong. Oh, no. Like, I don't want to do yeah, that again. <laughs> How can I not do this again? That's a really right. good thing that I've learned in my adult life is self-reflection. And I, it's like ripping a band-aid off. And like, I want to make my mistakes mine so nobody can use them against me. And I want to 
I want to own my mistakes. I think that's a real, and like we're going through that with my son at the moment. We're teaching him mistakes are fine. Mistakes are fine mm-hmm. when you own them, when they're yours and you don't let people use them against you. Mistakes are fine. Right. So I'm like that as a person. So when I mess up the balance a bit, um, I just try and learn from it. But it's, it's so hard. I think the biggest lesson for me was stop people pleasing because it was the people pleasing aspects that I used to do was the mm-hmm. number one reason of why I couldn't balance my life very well. Um, mm-hmm. And you know, the says like the triangle is like the life. So you've got work, you've got family and you've got love. And when, mm-hmm. and then the triangle can't hold up if one of them's out of kilter, but one of them's always out of kilter. Mm-hmm. I don't believe that. I believe that we can put some safety structure around those three those three elements and we can lean on them but we just don't break them so I think for me it's like I stopped people pleasing it got rid of loads of toxic people in my life it allowed me to reassess who I wanted to be and as a mum like being a mum is my absolute favorite title I'm a wife I'm a daughter, I'm a friend, I'm a tech, I'm a mentor, but mum is my favourite. And it's the one that I am the most passionate about. Like, even though I'm passionate about my job, I'm the most passionate about being the best mum for my son. And I want to be the parent that I didn't have. And I want to be the parent that I dreamt of. And I want to be the parent that's best for him, the parent that he needs, not necessarily the parent that I that makes me feel comfortable. I've got to be the parent that he needs. So that is always top priority. And the minute I let everybody know that, told me um, who was allowed in my life and who wasn't. Mm -hmm. And every single one of my clients, every single one of my clients are well aware that they are not my top priority. And when it comes to my life, it's it's my Mm -hmm. child, 100%. And the respect they give me for that is huge. And and it's mutual. Like, I know that I'm not more important than their kids. Like, your kids are your world. I get that. I'm not as important as your kids. And that's fine because ain't nobody more important than mine. So coming to the balance, it's just really, really learning. Like, you're going to mess up. You, you, you are. You're going to mess up. It's how you deal with it. It's how you own it. Right. It's how you reflect. It's how you learn. It's that's the important bit. It's not the it's not the mistake. It's how you deal with right. it. So yeah, balance is just not it's just not always balancing. But like I say, right. it's kind of like this. It's just a bit like Ooh. um but I'd like to say yeah, I'd like to say that I enjoy all of the ups and that I learn from all of the downs. And when it comes to mental health as well, I have had a time in these last like four years, I'd say, um, Mm -hmm. I thought mental health was a choice when I was younger. I was a bit naive to it. And then now I totally understand it's not a choice, it's an identity. And it's just up to us individually to do the best we can with the tools we've got, with mm-hmm. the knowledge that we have right. to do what's best for us innately. And you kind of can't always care about the outside world. Just You just need to sometimes focus on you and your bubble, you know, your your people. Um, mm. But, yeah, it's, it must be hard for, like, every, like, like everybody. I think everybody would accept they have some level of anxiety, imposter syndrome, depression, mental health, mm-hmm. panic attacks. I don't know any one person that hasn't resonated with one of those aspects, but mm-hmm. it's just how you cope and learning different mm-hmm. coping skills and um, tools that work for you and resonate for you. I, I meditate a lot and I find that really mm-hmm. empowering and it really does send to me. And I go mm-hmm. to it in times where I find I'm not coping, I'm not coping, let me just recenter. 
and that's huge for me it was, it was something that I learned on my honeymoon we went to Thailand and I learned it there and I just was like wow this is this is well helpful I'm going to do this more yeah. um so I think it's just learning different coping mechanisms and and just try different things and self-reflecting on the things that trigger you or the things that are a bit toxic or you know mm. it's just yeah I don't know I don't know if mm. I'd I feel like the outside world might think I've got it together and that's great, but I don't feel like, I don't feel like the balance is always balancing, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that's okay. Last but not least, where can people find you on social media? How can people support you and the Fierce Company? So um, I have the Fierce Company on Instagram, which is just the Fierce Company. Um, if you type that in, you'll see my mugshot on there. Um, and there's also <laughs> there's also um, my website, which is at thefearscompany.com. And that is where you'll find all bits and bobs about the things that are coming soon and all of the different services that will be on offer. And yeah, Power Hours. That's where I do my mentorship at the moment. So it's like a one-to-one -one personalized mentor, mentor phone call. Um, and that's how I am individually helping everybody one step at a time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Sasha, for jumping on. Um, I appreciate this conversation. Um, your raw and honest opinion about the industry, especially in the UK, or what's going on in terms of how, you know, the business of business of the nail industry and the education of the nail industry in the UK is is evolving and things like that. And and also, you know, how, you know, what can we do to fix it? So um, I really appreciate, you know, your honesty. I really appreciate this conversation. It was a great joy to speak with you. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I've had a blast. It has been lovely. And thank you for asking such interesting and thought provoking questions. We need more of this. We need more of this in this industry. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Hello, everybody. Thank you all so much for watching. Please like, comment, share, and subscribe to the channel. Be sure to click the bell for notifications. Also, follow me on my social media platforms. And be on the lookout for more interviews to come very soon. Take care, stay healthy, and stay beautiful. Bye-bye.